Who told you you could work with Quantic? The Big Book of Pop. The World Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll. The entire internet. Throw them all out. Are we here to amuse you and entertain you? And replace them with the Blagger's Guide. This is going to hurt. Radio's cut out and keep guide to the entire history of popular music in sound bite sized form. This show don't have no rhythm. <laughs> Too busy to wade through the entire history of rock just to find out what ragga means? Too snowed under by life's demands to learn which REM albums Bill Berry isn't on? <laughs> you know, I think the, you know, Quantic and Fireman are the real heroes. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Um, I listen to it on the toilet. Well done. Yes, I set my alarm to go off after Jonathan Ross. Can't stand him. His terrible diction. Hello, I'm David Quantic. In exactly 1,620 seconds from now, you'll be able to amaze and impress your friends with your newfound and effortless knowledge. This week, we present Liverpool, Two-Tone and the Inner Mounting Flame by John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and some other things. But first, listen carefully. What do these classic tunes have in common? Anything that sounds like Motown on a pub jukebox or in hospital, it's important to have just the right expression on your face. You need to look as if you're in on a secret. Then you mumble something like the sound of young America and say Earl Van Dyke, eh? Couldn't be anyone else. If questioned on this, you then go, well, everyone knows he was the leader of the house band at Motown. For extra emphasis, you could say that they recently played as the Funk Brothers, their original name, for the first time in 40 years. That'll shut them up. Blag as fact. Tamla Records creator Barry Gordy invented his sound by hiring songwriters by the crate load. Holland Dozier Holland, Smokey Robinson, Norman Whitfield. They all wrote songs and they all produced, but nothing was bigger than the Motown sound. Not even the singers. In fact, Gordy would even... Blag as fact. ...put the same song with a different act until he got the best coupling. Here's Marvin Gaye's classic, I heard it through the grapevine. And here's the original by Motown artist Gladys Knight. Free pips, as we blaggers say. And it wasn't just songs that he recycled. Berry Gordy could take a thin, weedy woman with a thin, weedy voice and turn her into one of the most glamorous stars of all time. That's right, Michael Jackson. No. Diana Ross, the love of Berry Gordy's life and the queen of Motown. Here now is a genuine reconstruction of a seminal Motown moment. The Supremes are here to see you, Mr. Gordy. Ace, send them in. <laughs> Hi. Hey, girls, Diana, baby, take a seat. Uh, you uh, other two in the Supremes, uh, what's your names? Uh, you can stand over there by the exit sign. I'm not happy, Mr. Gordy Jr. Why's that, Diana? I don't like the girl's choice of new single. I want to do my song, Mr. Gordy Jr., sir. Hmm, sounds good to me. What's it called? I may be skinny and have no voice, but I'd sure like to have sex with you, Mr. Gordy Jr. I like it. Say, why don't you two other girls with better voices go work out some catchy back and singer routines and later grow old and bitter in poverty? But you haven't heard me sing yet, Mr. Gordy Jr. Motown, of course, had other stars. Artists like Marvin Gaye, real surname G-A-Y, Stevie Wonder, not blind from birth, blindness caused by oxygen starvation, and the Isley Brothers. They were brothers. Remember that these artists are so famous and well-respected that you must always refer to them by first name only. Marvin, Stevie, the... But Motown went from strength to strength, and in 1969, they signed what you must always say is their last great act, the Jackson Five. When you talk about the Jackson Five, make the following joke. 
count off their great songs on your fingers. I want you back, ABC, Rockin' Robin, and at that point say, well, two Motown classics and a song about a robin. They don't even have proper robins in America. They get crows and paint them. Sit back, inhale your imaginary cigar, or hide in the toilet as they burn your Mondeo in the car park. It's time for another... Blaggers fact. The Jackson 5 were discovered by a scout. No, not a nine-year-old with knobbly knees, a talent scout. But the Motown publicity machine told everyone Diana Ross had discovered them, whereas in reality, if Diana Ross had found a bunch of young kids running around a house singing about robins, she'd have had them shot, stuffed and mounted in lifelike poses, possibly. Oh, and if the thought of Michael Jackson living with four boys disturbs you, it's all right, he's a kid as well. It was the late 60s. Motown's fame and empire grew, but some were dissatisfied. I mean, I'm not happy, Stevie. Me neither, Marvin. Man, Barry Gordy's factory mentality and devotion to the winning formula are stifling me. Yeah, I envy the creative freedom given to the Beatles and Bob Dylan. Exactly. I also want to take a lot of drugs, move to Belgium, and write about sex. But first, I have this idea for a concept album about the whole state of the world. Well, heavy trip. What's it called? What's going on? Mr. Gordy Jr. Marvin, Stevie, I don't pay you to sit in bars. Get back to the factory. We've got nine albums to make before Friday, and those songs don't write themselves. Yes, yes sir. Sorry, sorry, sir. White people loved Motown. Bob Dylan said Smokey Robinson was America's greatest living poet. The Beatles performed Motown songs. This turned out to be a bit ironic. Like Motown. Yeah, Smokey Robinson, uh, Marvin Gaye, the Supremes. Have you heard of Michael Jackson? Uh, of course not. It's 1963 and he's only about two. Well, we will like him, I'm sure. Might even do a single with him. But what about when he buys your entire back catalogue and leases it out for commercials? Oh, damn it. Have you got any questions about singing frogs? Anyway, all eras come to an end, and even Barry Gordy's dream changed to a new dream of Hollywood. And so Motown left its roots in Detroit and moved to LA to only occasionally visit the charts, but mostly the charts would pretend to be out when Motown came to visit or would put on funny voices and say, the charts have moved, they don't live here anymore when Motown rang the bell. But its best music still lives on in our memories. We'll be back after this made up advert. Bear with us. My fellow members of Kraftwerk. Hello, Ralph. How was your trip to Earth? It was ace. I went on the Trans Europe Express and won the Tour de France. And I post for consumer products now and then. What sort of music do the humans like? They are weird. They take their little guitars and they hit the strings. <laughs> <laughs> then they hit little bits of ivory in a big box. <laughs> with their little sticks <laughs> <laughs> and then a hairy ape shouts about sex over all of it <laughs> for modern synthesized electronic music get Kraftwerk <laughs> I can only apologize Goth the original Goths lived in Germany or something and were hairy conquerors of Europe they raged across the continent, hacking people's heads off and teaching them German, and were famous for sacking Rome, or at least asking for its notice. They had nothing to do with pop music, because they were German. But they gave the name to A, a kind of spooky cathedral, and B, a school of macabre literature. The first great Gothic novel is not, as one might suppose, something Nick Cave wrote on tour, but Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which she wrote, amazingly, for a bet she had on with Lord Byron. You don't get that with Nick Hornby, do you? Here is a rare bootleg recording of the fateful night of that story's creation. So, Mary, I shall write a story that will chill you to the very bone. Fie, sir, I doubt that to be the case. What theme shall you take? Why, I shall conjure up a tale of demons of the night, of hobgoblins and witches. Truly, it will chill the blood. 
And what of your story? It's either going to be about a man called Frankenstein who brings a corpse to life with a big forehead and bolts in its neck that kills everyone, or about a really pale girl who wears black and sits in her room listening to the Cocteau Twins all day. Gothic literature really came to a head with Bram Stoker, a man famous for writing the only classic horror story set in Whitby, a town previously only well known for fish and heartbeat. <laughs> Dracula changed the metaphorical face of the novel and also the literal faces of lots of kids who didn't like Wham. But it was fraught with difficulty, as this original CD-ROM from 1860 proves. Well, Mr Stoker, we here at Victorian Books are delighted with the manuscript of your new novel, Dracula. Thank you very much, Mr Chamford. There are, however, one or two changes we would like to make. <laughs> Is the violence too strong for your timid stomach, sir? Do you find the undercurrent of sexuality a tad vivid? No, we think that's ace. We're publishers, Mr Stoker. We like a bit of murder and shagging. No, we're more concerned about, uh, well, uh, take page 34, for instance. What's wrong with page 34? Let me read a few lines. <clears throat> The Count awoke as night fell. He arose from his casket and put on the new Bauhaus album. This is great, he said, as he teased his hair up like Robert Smith out of The Cure. Now for some snake bite. Uh, I'm sorry, I must have been pissed when I wrote that. So, the stage was set for goth. Gloom, darkness, lots of black and way too much eyeliner. But in rock terms, who invented goth? Well, the first person outside a gay prison or a touring production of the Rocky Horror Show was Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees. Blaggers fact! Susie Sue was also an original punk who appeared in the original Bill Grundy interview but was also one of the Bromley contingent, along with Billy Idol. Her real name is Susan Dalian and she married her own drummer. Which is a bit weird. The rest of the band must have been hideous. Anyway, Susie Sue probably invented goth. Certainly the Banshee's music, circular tribal rhythms, angular guitar riffs and banging on about death and dollies and all that kind of thing was a massive influence on later goth bands. Let's hear it for Alien Sex Fiend, Sex Gang Children, The Sisters of Mercy, Bauhaus, Dead Can Dance, Fields of the Nephilim, All About Eve, Jean Loves Jezebel, and a thousand other bands whose names sound like racehorses. The best goth act ever were The Mission. Formed by Wayne Hussey, who was... Black as fact. An ex-member of the Sisters of Mercy and a former Mormon from the Midlands who was personal friends with Donny Osmond. No, really. The Mission, or The Mish, as the fans called them, combined lumpy rock with honking vocals like a goose. They played the Reading Festival every year for a decade, and they never wrote any good songs ever. In contrast to the other best goth act ever. The Birthday Party. Named after a Harold Pinter play, The Birthday Party were Australian goths and were led by the young Nick Cave. These days, Nick Cave wears a suit and tie and sings folk songs with Kylie Minogue. But back in the day, he used to run around with no pants on, shouting at bonfires. And nowadays, if you ask him if he was a goth, he gets ratty. As does Susie Sue and Robert Smith out of The Cure and that cheekbony singer out of Bauhaus. In fact, if you believe all the people in goth bands, there are no goth bands. Which is a bit scary, if you think about it. Why don't I now we're going into a break, which means we've got an advert that inevitably starts with the words, In a world. In a world without funk, one man wanted to make a difference. He wanted it all. This is the story of that man. Blueprint by Ray Charles. And Louis Jordan. He was James Brown, godfather of soul. I'm gonna make him a funky offer he can't refuse. The story of his cruelty. Get on the good foot and put it in that concrete boot. His brutality. Take him to the bridge and throw him off. And his ultimate descent. Yeah, man. Get your hands up. I didn't touch your 
And that, and that far round, very hood you know why. The stuff that makes you high, that PCP in mind. Yeah, I feel bad, pretty bad, yeah. James Brown, soul brother number one in movie theaters and record shops. Now. That was great. Welcome back to The Blagger's Guide, the show that each week provides a nonsensical but comprehensive guide to popular music in an easy-to-keep format to impress your friends and stun your enemies. Now, we're taking a look at Two-Tone. There's only one thing you need to know about Two-Tone. It's 1960s blue beat recreated in the post-punk era. Bye! Oh, you want details, do you? It's 1979. Punk is dead, but Duran Duran are still doing their hair. There's nothing to replace it. The kids want something new. I quite like that ska music. You know, Prince Buster and that. Me too. It's fast, and you can dance to it. Hey, if we formed a band, we could make our own ska music. But only if we had the contemporary edge and the sweaty rhythms of punk. And if we can dress a bit like mods in clothes that are both black. And why? A colour scheme which also reflects the multiracial diversity of the music. Let's call it Humbug Rock. Nah! Let's call it Two Tone! And so Two Tone was born. In two different places, which must have been painful. One was Coventry, where people with real sensible names like Jerry Dammers and Terry Hall formed the specials. One was London, where people with stupid names like Suggs and Chaz Smash formed Madness. Laggers. Fact. How to make a two-tone record. Take an old Jamaican ska record by Prince Buster and speed it up. Bye! OK, it's not quite that simple. Early two-tone records did combine the feel of ska with the urgency of punk, but they did so in an original inventive manner. Take the specials Gangsters. It was a cynical attack on a former manager stuck to a Prince Buster riff. while Madness's The Prince was a jerky, funky riff welded to a tribute to Prince Buster. An earthquake is erupting, but not in our street. The nation was two-tone crazy. Soon new bands were springing up like a terrier wanting a biscuit. The Selector, The Beat, Bad Manners, some other bands. Flaggers, fact. How to form a two-tone band? You will need A, an old Jamaican bloke. The specials had trombonist Rico. And the beat had Saxa, the only musician ever named after some salt. Two, you'll need a really obscure ska song to have a hit with, like, say, A Message to You, Rudy. A message to you, Rudy. Or Tears of a Clown. No Three, social comment. By 1981, Two-Tone was everywhere, and it was liked by everyone. That's everyone. Well, I'm a student, and I enjoy Two-Tone because it mixes politics and social comment with a dance beat. I'm a skinhead, and I like it because it's hard and not weird like student music. I like it because I can dress up as a rude boy and jump up and down! Now Two-Tone was the most popular music in the world ever. But the bands grew weary of fame, wealth and little kids jumping up and down. They wanted to be mature. <laughs> Lads, Lord Suggs welcomes one and all. The annual meeting of Two-Tone groups is now in session. Item one, now what? Jerry Damas. Thank you, Suggs. I propose a new direction for the specials. Instead of making punky reggae songs that little kids can jump up and down to, I want to go all moody and use 1960s easy listening influences. Anyone else? Chaz Smash from Madness. Yeah, I'd just like to say that Madness' new direction is also going to be moody, but more left wing and sort of sad in a kinks kind of way. And what will this do for our career? Nothing, but it won't matter, because we can all get back together in 20 years and support Morrissey. All right. Anybody else? Buster Blood Vessel from Bad Manners? Ah, yeah. I just wanted to say that we don't have a new direction. We're going to carry on singing about bear and monkeys. Ah. And so Two Tone matured from this. Madness. Madness. They call it madness. 
response to this. But it did go out in a blaze of glory. Free Nelson Mandela! Free Nelson Mandela, which didn't just get Nelson Mandela out of jail, but... I go, oh, I can't be bothered. ...was produced by Elvis Costello, who not only had a single on two-tone, but produced the first specials album, Ranking. So there we have it, The Blagger's Guide to Two-Tone. Don't move. We'll be back with The Blagger's Guide to Liverpool after these words. Let's just blow the dust off this bit of imaginary archive advert. And reel up the tape. Reel up. Hello. Oh, Alice, this record's really marvellous. Yeah, it is rather good, isn't it? I don't mean to be rude, but this sounds a bit like jazz. The jazz is merely a tiny bejeweled starling fluttering around amidst the flock of amplified rock vultures that is the post Hendrix machine gun guitar of John McLaughlin. I'm not sure I should be listening to this without Lawrence's say so, and he's at golf. Is it hot in here, or is it just me? Mary, live a little! <laughs> <laughs> the Inner Mountain Flame by John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra is out now. Eight shillings and sixpence from Boots and other good record stores. Product recall. The following product is being recalled. EMI Artist 79562, Robbie Williams. Despite a record of reliability and popularity within some sectors, Robbie Williams has become increasingly unreliable. Consumers have reported becoming physically sick of Robbie Williams, and a significant number report that Robbie Williams does their heads in. Moreover, Robbie Williams has been found to be completely useless in the United States, where he does not work at all. Please stop listening to or watching Robbie Williams at once. Customers who can provide a receipt or tickets double have the years they've wasted. Return to them by post. Thank you. Shush. Now the Blagger's Guide comes literally from a seaport in the northwest of England, somewhere between Manchester and Rill. It's the most important city in British rock music. That's right, Liverpool! <laughs> Calm down. Why is Liverpool the most important city in the history of rock? Oh, I don't know. See, no particular reason, but Liverpool produces bands the way a lady spider produces little baby spiders. And it all started here in the Albert Dock. Blagger's fact. Here's a fact to impress your friends with. First of all, tell them that the Liverpool music scene was invented by stewards on Cunard liners coming back home with rock and roll records. Mate, mate, mate. all right, la. Can I interest you in these uh, 78 RPM recordings of Muddy Waters, Louis Jordan, Huey Smith, then a couple of years later, Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, and Little Richard? Ace, thanks. Me and my Maisie big friends will assimilate all these wonderful new sounds. But if someone else tries that on you, look at them and go, oh yes, the Cunarder myth, and tell them no one's ever met one of these mythical stewards. Mate, 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 all right, la. Can I interest you in these off? No less an authority than John Lennon said that the whole Cunarder thing was rubbish. And he should know his stepfather was a Cunarder. Called, extra blaggers point here, Twitchy. We're now in Matthew Street, home of the Cavern Club. Now the Beatles threw such a large shadow over Liverpool, it's very hard to dismiss their importance. So we're going to. Partly because, like a Scouse boomerang, the Beatles never came back to Liverpool, they just sang about it. And partly because they spawned a lot of really awful Mersey Beat bands. I like it, I like it. Shut up. Anyway, time passed, the Beatles split up, wings happened. Liverpool became known as a place where bands used to come from. But then, in May 1977, came the Crucial Three. All right. All right. Hello? The Crucial Three split up after six weeks, but not before forming three new bands. Julian Cope's Teardrop Explodes. 
Ian McCulloch's Echo and the Bunny Men, and Pete Wiley's War. Where's the band naming monitor when you need him? Meanwhile, Liverpool woke up. The Beatles became fashionable again. Bands like the Boo Radleys. Wake up, it's a beautiful morning. The Lars. And the Lightning Seeds. Mersey Madness continues to this day, with bands like the Zootons and the Coral carrying the Liverpool flame, whatever that is. Because Liverpool really is the home of British rock and or pop. And we haven't even mentioned orchestral manoeuvres in the dark, or Shack, or those naughty lumps, or China Crisis, or Big in Japan, whose bass player Holly Johnson went on to be the singer in Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Hmm, maybe we should have mentioned Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And we'll be back next week with little chunks of fact about post-punk, Ireland, David Bowie, and something else I haven't thought about. Bye. Right. Here are the credits. But as it's radio, they can't scroll from bottom to top like a film, so they're going from right to left. Writers, David Quantic and Simon Poole. Presenter, David Quantic. Again. Producer, Simon Poole. Again. Mix engineer, Chris O'Shaughnessy. Series editor, David Morley. Don't fade me out. Most male characters, Lewis McLeod. Most of the ladies, Kate Sullivan. Don't fade me out. I'm coming back, I'm coming back. T-Boy, Robbie Williams. Wardrobe, Oxfam. Mr. Quantic's hair by John Inman. Do not fade me out. You wouldn't fade out Stuart McConey. Don't fade me out.